When we pull together global studies, we find that only one in three companies feel ready to keep up with the pace of the future. I personally am very excited for the future. We are now living at the beginning of a new area of humankind, at the beginning of the age of AI. We are now witnessing history unfolding around us that future generations will read up on. I find that super cool, to be honest. But I also understand that people can get scared about it and be scared to be left behind. So let's have a look why exactly digital transformations fail. Well, I think it's exactly in the world. People don't really transform themselves. They often just have a checklist. They work for it. Ah, we have a new cloud. We have done some new work. We're done. But they don't challenge themselves sufficiently to actually create a digital revolution. And to really have a digital revolution happening, you need three things equally. You need a psychological understanding of your employees and your clients, both today and in the future. You need a technical foundation on an understanding of the big trends that are happening that goes beyond just reading buzzwords in the newspaper. So before those buzzwords show up in the media, you should already have built something that is ahead of that. And third of all, you need business models that scale with the future and that are truly future-proof. Bring together my background as a tech entrepreneur and investor, coming from companies such as Google and Amazon, and being originally a neuroscientist and psychologist, here are a few selected methods for you that worked for me. First of all, the most important, it's absolutely key to build your companies like clockworks. Everything must be predictable and streamlined, everything should be efficient, and all processes in a company, from human interactions to factory development, should work together like a cogwheel and the wheels mash together. That's, of course, complete nonsense. In reality, that may work for factories, but humans are beautiful because they are so incredibly complex. We have emotions, we have desires, wishes, social interactions, but this human element creates uncertainty, which exactly makes our lives dynamic. And that's why the real business world doesn't function like a clockwork, but rather like a jungle. A jungle that is wild, that is dynamic. Imagine yourself being a monkey that runs through the forest, tries to survive, has to innovate and adapt to new changes. But still, if you look at the forest from some difference, there is structure. In this environment, in this jungle ecosystem, there, is still, there are some rules that work. There are still some structures that are in place. However, the overall framework is that of adaptability. And I fundamentally believe that the number one leadership skill, leadership skill of the future is going to be that you embrace seeing your job as a jungle rather than a clockwork. That you are really excited about thriving in this ambiguity. And the reason why you need to do that is because of the existence of black swans. Black swans are a concept from economics that describe extremely unlikely events that, however, if they happen, will have drastic consequences for our status quo. This can be a crisis like the COVID pandemic that forced all of us to adapt to a new situation, but it can also be innovations like ChatGPT and the current race, uh, rise of generative AI we are witnessing. And trust me, ChatGPT is just the tip of the iceberg what's coming here. So innovations and crises alike force us to readjust and rethink how we do the things we're doing every day. So what's my advice here? Should we all spend five hours a day discussing what unlikely events may happen and prepare ourselves for it? Probably not. The black swans, by definition, are not really predictable. What you can do then is to can build structures in your companies that do not break under the black swans, but grow with them. What you can do is establish mindsets in your company and processes that grow with when the black swans are flying by making them scalable, agile, and not codependent too much. Away from the clockwork, towards the jungle. One really important thing here in establishing this black swan friendly environments from the inside of the company is to end the hippo culture. Well, who are the hippos? 
I guess many of you are, HIPPO stands for highest paid person's opinion, so it describes this classical model in companies where people with higher salaries in hierarchy dictate the culture and what's happening. But if we truly think about this new world where innovation happens on a daily basis, where we have to rethink our companies almost every day, it doesn't just work if one mind tries to control all of this. We need everyone to be involved. And this bottom-up sharing of ideas, allowing interns to speak up in board meetings if they have a new idea how to, the company should reinvent itself, that's going to be key in the future. Bottom-up idea sharing, focusing on the ideas that matter and not on the hierarchy. A great example here is Gmail. Gmail was a 20% project at Google. To explain this, uh, we as Google employees, we are always allowed to have 20% of our time dedicated to some fun project we think is going to make a difference in the future. Gmail started exactly as such a side project. Someone tried something out, it seemed to work, and Google's leadership invested heavily into it and made it a global success. This would have never happened if Google had a very strict hierarchical model how we operate things. When we talk about out-of-the-box thinking, I can also bring in another employer of me, namely Amazon. Amazon Cloud is one of the most profitable businesses in the world right now, and the history of Amazon Cloud is that Amazon grew from a bookstore into a global logistics company and suddenly realized, hey, we have so many data flying around here, how do we organize this? So that was the birth of Amazon Cloud. And then they've really thought one step ahead of that and were like, hey, look, let's outsource this cloud and offer it to other companies so they can also profit from it. And here my appeal to you is really think about your own companies. What resources do you have right here and now which are actually great innovations that other people could profit from? Fundamentally, business is about solving someone else's pain points and problems. And if you internally have created something that really works well for you, why not share it with the world? I believe, for example, if you're an energy giant who has figured out a great way how to organize your grid problems and your headaches, why not outsource this software to other energy companies as a software as a service model? And suddenly, overnight, you have turned from an energy company to a software provider. And this agility, this flexibility needs courage, but it also needs ideas. And not just the ideas of management, but of everyone involved. And, by the way, I love dogs, so this is one of the favorite slides I have today. Um, fundamentally, this dedication to customer experience, this dedication to innovating yourself, it's not just great for new business models, it's also great for yourself. In the neuroscience of fear, we find that one of the most prominent ways to conquer fear is dedication. If you have something you're burning for, a project you really believe in, where you align with the values and you can see progress, you develop self-efficacy. Self-efficacy means you have the feeling that you are competent, the feeling that you can succeed. If you have small baby steps on your path towards the end of a project, you will really develop the frame that you can do it. And then think about it. If not just you yourself, but the entire company as a whole has this feeling of self-efficacy, what you can do. And it's, by the way, the same for private life. As a tech investor and entrepreneur, trust me, every day I have to deal with a lot of uncertainty. I have to make a lot of big decisions. And also, there's, of course, doubt of failure. Like, what am I doing here? The fundamental thing I do, every morning I get up at the same time, I do a morning workout, I have a cold shower, and then at first I do the most annoying task of the day, so it's out of my way, and then I just take it from there. You see a little structure in the bigger jungle, and this dedication to solving other people's problems is what keeps me going. Um, if we think about solving other people's problems, that's great, but we also need to know what problems do we want to solve. That's why we need to build up innovation ecosystems within our companies. This can be a think tank you launch to research the trends of tomorrow, so you're not jumping behind the trends that you see now in the media, but you're already ahead of the curve. This can mean talking to experts, inviting keynote speakers, doing workshops in your companies, or even building up your own innovation teams. Fundamentally, 
You should exchange yourself with experts in Silicon Valley, in China, with experts in startups, and create a network, an ocean of information and innovation in your company. And if this ocean really soaks through your company, soaks through every employee, then you can cast stones into it and ripples will fly. And these ripples are what digital revolution actually is. Of course, if we want to make big change happen, we also need the right people for it. We need talent. And something I hear often hear with my clients is that they believe that just because they come from a less sexy industry, a more traditional one, they cannot find great talents. Well, let me tell you, that is a myth. If you have a social mission and values that you stand for, which you don't just put on marketing slides, but you're actually living and feeling, if you have great projects and ambitions, such as fundamentally transforming your current industry and creating something new, trust me, the talent is going to come to you. Because the talent of tomorrow wants to work in creating the future and the history books I spoke about before, and the talent of tomorrow looks for a social mission. And if you can provide that package together, trust me, no matter what kind of company you are, the talent will be coming. So now we have everything is great. We have the talent coming in. We have an innovation ecosystem. The black swans are kind of under control. The hippo culture is done. Everyone's hyped. Everyone's great. We start digital transformation. And then it happens. Projects fail. People leave the company. Predictions turn out to be wrong. A black swan shows up, which we wrongly predicted, and breaks our entire business model. People walk out. There's bad press about us. We're the laughingstock of society. And here, and this is the moment of truth, this is where digital transformation actually happens. Not just thinking the leaders have to motivate the employees. No. As an employee, taking responsibility to keep up the motivation even if things go south. The moment of truth will happen for each and every company aspiring greatness. Each and every individual of us aspiring greatness will have these moments when you want to quit. And when comfort, when laziness, when excuses and indifference and fear fundamentally become prominent. And what we need to do in this moment is to understand that success doesn't mean having a big wave of motivation and running for a goal, but success means getting up again when you fall. So digital transformation has never happened in your company if you stop it after your first failure. It has happened if you keep trying for the 50th time, fail and fail and fail again, and still manage to adapt and get up again. That is when you can talk about digital revolution and not before that. And looking at psychotherapy, we also see, um, going back here a bit to my neuroscience background, we see that fear fundamentally can be overcome if we expose ourselves to it in small doses. For those of us scared of spiders, if you expose yourself to spiders over time, put them on your shoulders and see them, your fear of them will decrease or even disappear fully. The amygdala is the part of our brain that mitigates fear responses, and you can control the exposure by having, by having an encounter with what you fear. And it's the same for digital transformation. If people are really scared to lose their job to ChatGPT, download it. Download the plugins. Play around with it. Become a friend with them, right? If you're scared of all the trends that are happening, do a trip to Silicon Valley, have a look around, attend some webinars, some free webinars, talk to experts, talk to people you know in the field, and actually get to know what you're afraid of. Because trust me, before I said dedication conquers fear, a second truth of the neuroscience of fear is knowledge conquers fear as well. And if you have dedication and knowledge throughout your company, throughout everyone's mindset, that is when you can overcome the paralyzing effects of the pace in the world. And so I would like to end this talk with my life slogan that I follow both in my private but also professional life. I believe in being fast. The world is going to develop faster and faster, and if we are not also fast in how we think, how we process information, how we adapt, we will always lag behind the market but never lead it. Okay, but being fast also means failing. 
Because if you're prioritizing speed, you will make failures, you will make errors. That's just in the nature of things. You can either control all variables or be fast. So I choose the path of speed and failure. But the most important here is to fail smart. Failing smart means never failing twice for the same reason and deeply understanding why you failed in the first place. Absorb it, share it. Don't like hoard it like a dragon hoards its gold. Share the knowledge you have created with your teams and make sure you as a company grow your collective intelligence. And the first thing I believe in is not just thinking big, but daring to think big. Because thinking big is scary. If you leave your uh, nice big tech jobs and there's suddenly a startup entrepreneur with no income, that's scary. If you go up to your CEO and tell them you want to revolutionize your company and it may fail and you're the reason why this company died, that's scary. If you tell people, hey, we are now using new AI technologies in our company without actually really understanding yourself how these algorithms work, that can be scary. But fundamentally, greatness is made by facing fear. And I believe that a life that dares to think big can be a great one. And so I ask all of you to look around you. The future has already begun and it will be an exciting one. Stay excited both as a company and as a human being. Thank you very much.